All right, well, good afternoon, good evening to any and all APUSH students who are tuned in for our live YouTube broadcast or later on recorded video. Are you excited? Are you nervous? Do you have a little bit of intrepidation about the upcoming test? You have come to the right spot. Your teachers have taught you well, but uh, we are going to get you through. We're going to give you the vitamins needed to do what you need to do. My name is Sean Redmond. I am a high school history, U.S. history, and a government teacher in Southern California at Bolsa Grande High School in Garden Grove. And I also work uh, for and with the Bill of Rights Institute. And uh, they are the ones bringing you here something fantastic. We have uh, a great expert in the field uh, who is going to come on here. I will be monitoring the chat, the questions, and so forth. But we have someone who is fantastic. We have Tom Ritchie. Tom Ritchie is a Louisiana native. He teaches history and government classes in South Carolina. He's been teaching AP U.S. history since 2008. And since 2012, he has published uh, AP U.S. history-related content on his YouTube channel and website. Uh, I am a big fan. Uh, welcome to Tom, and let's get this show on the road. All right. Thank you, Sean. And uh, hey there, students. Uh, welcome to our you know, annual review with the Bill of Rights Institute. We are going to be doing this for the next, uh, you know, we're going to have nine review sessions. Um, the first one is tonight, and then we'll be going Monday through Thursday, okay? And that's all going to be at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And then we are going to take Friday and Saturday off. We'll come back Sunday through Wednesday for sessions six through nine. Okay, so basically every night until the exam minus Friday and Saturday will be here at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Now also I'll direct your attention to the description. Okay, so if we go to the video description here, you will see a link to a Google document where I'll be sharing all of the materials that we do during this live session. Now in, uh, in addition to that, Sean is going to be putting in materials if he sees some things that'll be helpful. Now, y'all feel free. Looks like we've got about 57 of you watching now. Feel free to go into the chat and let me know what you're thinking. I've got some things, of course, I could talk about a push for hours and hours, but let's make sure that y'all are interacting here in the chat and letting us know what y'all want to see here. Okay, so with that, with no further ado, we want to note that this course starts in 1491. Okay, 1491 is kind of a symbolic year, okay, because it's the year before 1492 when we have the first European contact, which is setting up the exchange in the Atlantic world, okay, between Africa, Asia, and the Americas. So with that, let's go ahead and begin with just uh, a bit about Native American cultures. Now, when you go into the Google document that we've got here, there's me. All right, so you can see here that I've got uh, a graphic organizer here in the Google Doc and also a link to a formal lecture and video, okay? So my lecture notes are there on my website. So going from there, first of all, we want to think in terms of that there are several, there were several different um, Indian populations in the present day United States, and each tribal group lived a lifestyle in accordance with its environment. So one of the big things that you want to note here, because they may ask you something like, you know, what did this, uh, what did this group have in common with this group? And what you want to think about is what did natives all have in common with each other? So we've got several different groups that come up in the course and exam description. You've got the Northeast, the Southeast, um, you've got uh, the Southwest, the Great Plains. Now note they've also labeled the Great Basin, uh, but this is, looks like, you know, Nevada, Utah, this tends to have more in common than not with the natives on the Great Plains. So it's not necessarily that all of these have to be taken into account. So for example, what we're going to see in the Northeast and the Southeast, we see that hunting and gathering is supplemented by settled agriculture, okay? So in the Northeast and the Southeast, we're seeing settled agriculture. Now it's on the Great Plains where you see 
hunting and gathering, okay, where basically you've got the bison herds, uh, or popularly known as buffalo. And this is where we are going to see hunting and gathering almost exclusively because, um, you know, of the plentiful, uh, you know, the plentiful protein with the bison herds. Now, of course, that's going to be made possible by the Colombian exchange, that horses are going to arrive from Europe. So one thing that we want to note here, okay, we definitely don't want to look at Native Americans as being just acted upon by Europeans. Uh, you know, we also want to note here that Europeans and Natives are involved in an exchange with each other. And there are ways in which the European contact, uh, you know, makes uh, makes changes in Native lifestyles that are by choice. And the Plains Indians are really the best example of something from the Colombian exchange creating something that is a key part of their lifestyle, which will continue until after the Civil War, the transcontinental railroads and the Western movement with the Homestead Act is going to make it to where um, the Plains Indians are no longer going to be able to, you know, continue the lifestyle that they had adopted after the Columbian Exchange. But remember, before the introduction of the horse, you're not uh, seeing that kind of mobility. Now, uh, when we look at uh, natives in the Southwest, uh, one thing we want to note here, a lot of this is desert. And so one of the things that comes up in your course and exam description is that there were some very advanced irrigation techniques, okay? When we think about Arizona, New Mexico, these are not places that naturally get a lot of rain. Okay, so that's something that you definitely want to uh, you want to make a note of here. And so from there, you know, when we look at California, okay, we're going to incorporate um, fishing along the West Coast. Okay, so that's going to be something important as well. But notice here that there is farming going on all over the place here. Now, again, I have got a proper lecture uh, that, uh, you know, that y'all are welcome to watch on YouTube. So I'm not going to spend too much, uh, too much time here. Um, but then noting as well, this kind of uh, three sisters agriculture, where you've got squash, corn, and beans all growing together. Okay. And I also get into a discussion about uh, gender roles, okay, where basically where you look at Europeans are coming in and men are typically the ones out plowing the fields, uh, whereas, uh, you know, given that the most of the natives do uh, slash and burn agriculture, which is less, uh, you know, you don't have a plow going um, there, you know, you've got women are doing the agricultural labor and men are tending to, uh, you know, tending to hunt and, uh, you know, tending to hunt basically. And so with this, now again, Again, uh, my full graphic organizer here. Now, you don't necessarily need to know names of particular tribes, but at the same time, I think that it's useful uh, to know things like the Iroquois or the Algonquin. This is the Northeast, the Great Lakes. You know, the Iroquois, uh, you know, a tribal confederation that ends up allying with the Dutch and then later the British and the Algonquins, uh, you know, being allied with the French. Now, that's the other thing that we want to note here is that, you know, when the Europeans come in, they basically start taking sides in tribal rivalries that already existed. So that's something that's important here. But as, and as far as that, you know, the Cherokee, for example, that's a major tribe in the Southeast. And we also want to make sure that there are, you know, the mound building culture in the Southeast and knowing that although this wasn't the case at the point of European contact, um, there was the city that they call Cahokia that several uh, hundred years before European contact, this was a very large city. We've got archaeological evidence of a very large city um, that is there outside of St. Louis. So again, this graphic organizer is available to you in the Google document. And let me go ahead and uh, let's see if we've got anything in the chat. So far, the chat's uh, looking kind of quiet, but y'all feel free. If there's anything y'all want to make sure that I'm getting on to in particular, remember that our focus today is, uh, you know, is the, the first, uh, first unit and the second unit. Um, and remember, if you're getting something out of this, remember to uh, hit that like button so that other people can uh, see this review with the Bill of Rights Institute. So going from there, 
ladies and gentlemen. Okay, how do you access the doc? Okay, so Carlin, you can actually just go into the video description. Okay, so there is a Google document that is accessible through the video description. And this Google document will have links to, you know, graphics and other things that I'm uh, that I'm bringing in there. So with that, and remember, if you've got a specific question or a specific topic you want me to focus on, go ahead and just let us know in the chat. Now, also, you'll note here that uh, that Sean is sharing some things that we're seeing from uh, the Bill of Rights Institute's website. OK, so we see here uh, Native American history and diversity. We see an essay and lessons. We also see a few videos we've got here um, for a video on mercantilism, for example. And as far as what happens here is, you know, if we're looking at the triangular trade. Now we'll talk about mercantilism a little bit uh, a little bit later as well. Um, but the triangular trade, you know, this is, you know, and no shame in taking a graphic off of Wikipedia because you know that, uh, you know, that they're okay with us using it. Okay. So when we talk about the trade that's going on in the Atlantic world um, that you're seeing here, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, okay? So basically the Americas and the Caribbean, um, they are bringing raw materials, okay? They're contributing raw materials, sugar, tobacco, coffee, um, and other things. They're bringing them to Europe. Now, Europeans are exporting manufactured goods, okay? So manufactured goods like textiles, uh, you know, rifle, you know, well, not rifles quite yet, but guns, uh, you know, which would be more uh, muskets at that time. So when we're looking at textiles, muskets, and other goods to Africa, and then from Africa, slaves going to the Americas. So that's what we're dealing with. When we talk about the Atlantic trade. Now, I've seen questions on this exam often refer to the Atlantic world, the Atlantic trade, the Atlantic system. Okay, so that's something that you'll want to know that this Atlantic trade is is this trade happening between Europe, Africa, and the Americas? Now, another thing that I want to note here that I've got this, uh, this graphic that I'm using courtesy of Marco Learning. Now, you're welcome to go to Marco Learning's website. There's a link there. Um, and just it's nice of them to let me use this graphic, okay? This is a graphic about the Columbian Exchange, okay? So what we want to note here, now what you don't want to do for this exam is try to memorize every fruit, vegetable, animal, all of that kind of stuff. You want to latch on to a few things here, okay? And so when we're looking at this, um, for example, like you can see here, I like to I like to look at a few things of significance, okay? So I would choose a few things going from the Americas to the old world, you know, the new world to the old world, and a few things going from the old world to the new world. Now, Try to be easy on yourself, okay? So for example, when I think about going from the Americas to Europe, Africa, and Asia, I think potatoes and tomatoes, okay? Why is that? Because tomatoes and potatoes rhyme, okay? I don't know, I think I said what I'm first, number. you know, they just, it's easy, potatoes and tomatoes. And what you can think about here is that Christopher Columbus, you know, coming from Italy, um, before he made that voyage, I mean, imagine like Christopher Columbus never like had marinara sauce, he never had a, you know, proper pizza, um, that Italy in 1492, Italians did not know what a tomato was, okay? And this is something where you're thinking about the significance, okay, of the Colombian exchange. And what this is, is this is this permanent trade relationship that is, you know, taking place between the old world and the new world. So tomatoes and then potatoes. Now imagine, uh, you know, the British, uh, you know, they wouldn't have ordered fish and, chi and chips. They would have just ordered fish, you know, fish and fish, um, you know, the French, French fries, and of course, the Belgians and the Dutch, you know, they love their, uh, their frites. And so when it comes down to it, that potatoes and tomatoes have changed um, the cuisine in the old world, okay? So that's what I tend to launch onto. Now also turkeys, which should be easy enough to remember because Benjamin Franklin, uh, you know, he suggested that a turkey be our national bird rather than an eagle because this is something that exists here. So I would not go too far down the list, all right? And so going from there as well, we see here livestock. Now we see a cow and a pig, right? We see a cow and a pig. 
um, but then that could also be horses, but really any kind of livestock, because one of the cultural differences that we see happening um, between the, you know, between the natives and the Europeans who come in is the natives did not have any concept of a of livestock, basically animals that were putting in a pen um, in preparation for slaughtering and eating them, okay? There was no idea of an animal belonging to somebody, for example. And so that's something, you know, when we think about like these livestock coming in, this idea of these are domesticated animals that are being grown for food. So any kind of livestock, cow, uh, you know, cow, pig, sheep, uh, you know, chickens, uh, and that sort of thing. Those are coming, those are going to come out. I don't know about chickens, but maybe, okay. But basically, we see, see a cow and a pig, and of course, horses that we've mentioned already. Now, we also want to note all of these European diseases, okay? Of course, uh, you know, over the past year, living through the coronavirus pandemic, y'all can see the impact um, of a novel, uh, you know, of a novel disease coming in, except uh, in this case, uh, you know, these diseases wiped out a very, very large portion of the native population. Now, these diseases were not uh, being brought in intentionally, but they are part of this exchange. So make sure that you understand this is more than about food and animals, okay? So this can also be the diseases that were brought in by Europeans. Now, also note that things like bananas and sugarcane, these are things that grow very well in Central America and the Caribbean, but they are not native to these places, okay? So when you look at things like, you know, something like sugar, sugar becomes such an important crop uh, because, you know, it was so rare because, you know, they knew about it. They just didn't have really anywhere to grow it. And so we see some of these things coming over and finding very fertile climates. So now the other thing here that we want to mention is that this is not just about goods and this isn't about food. Uh, this isn't just about diseases, but also ideas can be part of an exchange. So when you think about what's going on here, um, you know, when you think about the two C's coming from uh, coming from Europe to the Americas, Christianity and capitalism, okay? These are two, two ideas that really did not have any kind of background in the new world that Europeans are bringing with them. So understand that especially the Spanish and the French are coming in um, and they are bringing these ideas with them. Now with that, let me just go ahead and, uh, you know, take another look at the chat and see uh, what we've got there. Now, Sean will be addressing some of these questions. Oh, wow, the chat is, uh, is lighting up now. So that is excellent. Okay, so with that, um, you know, what we're, uh, what we're looking through here. Now, Ava, let me, you know, you've got a strategic question here that I'm going to address. How many tribes should we know for SAQ or MCQ, okay? Now, I think that, you know, typically I'm going to recommend, you know, and remember, it's not so much the individual tribes as much as these regional tribal groups, okay? So it's not so much like knowing in particular what the Sioux did, but then thinking about, you know, how did the, you know, how did the Sioux, like, you know, basically the Plains, uh, the Plains Indians, in general, okay? So when we're thinking about that, you know, I think that you you pick maybe three different regions and make sure you understand. Now, again, Northeast and Southeast are going to be virtually identical, okay? That you've got uh, settled agriculture combined with hunting and gathering. Um, the Plains Indians have their own, uh, you know, their own situation there. And then the native, you know, with them being nomadic, and then the natives in the Southwest uh, having their irrigation techniques and corn cultivation. And so that's something. And then when you get on the West Coast, remember that we're going to see if we're dealing with anybody in the coastal areas um, fishing again. But I would definitely think in terms of just those big groups and remembering again, Northeast, Southeast, besides it being a little bit colder in the Northeast, the lifestyles are similar because they're not completely nomadic. They do live in settled communities. And I would say that the Iroquois Confederation with their longhouses, that's something that is um, going to be extremely um, important there. And so with that, 
um, interactions, let's see, uh, something with the interaction among tribes themselves. Um, yeah, so basically, let me go into, I think that, uh, let's see, we've got Ali. Um, Ali, I think that, uh, you know, what we've got here, you're giving us a good question here to look at, the interactions between the tribes and colonies. Now, one thing I'll let you know is on my YouTube channel, and again, I'm Tom Ritchie, if anybody is unfamiliar um, with my work, is that I've got videos on, uh, you know, on New Spain and New France and New Netherland and, of course, English colonization as well okay so as far as that goes when we're thinking about relationships with the natives okay and again this one is on my youtube channel okay so this whole video is there and so with that uh yeah, so and then, uh, you know, some of the questions I'll get to some I won't, uh, you know, some of them Sean will address in the chat. So when y'all see Bill of Rights Institute in the chat, that's Sean who also teaches a push. Um, and then he'll be sending some questions to me. Now what I want to do is focus for the next bit on, um, you know, the colonial encounters between Europeans and natives. Okay, so one thing that we'll note here, and again, this is there is I've got a video on my YouTube channel, a full lecture about an eight minute lecture on New Spain. So as far as this goes, you know, we think about where the Spanish to present day Mexico, California, Southwest United States, Florida. Now the Spanish are Catholic, okay? And they are going to be what the people you're gonna see the most of in this course will be conquistadors and priests. Now, one of those priests um, is Bartolome de las Casas. Um, and he's somebody that, uh, that comes up quite often. A lot of y'all probably uh, read his work, uh, you know, in your A-Push class where he is writing about the abuses, um, you know, that are happening in New Spain. Now, the Spanish don't really have the best record um, of getting along with natives. They've got the encomienda system, which in some ways was a continuation of what had already been the case under the Aztec Empire. But this is a system of forced labor and tribute, okay? So the Spanish are extracting forced labor and tribute from the natives, uh, you know, in a similar way that the Aztecs had already done this. And so with this, uh, you know, what we're seeing here um, is that Bartolome de las Casas, you know, wrote about these abuses. And as a result of that, uh, the encomienda was abolished, at least in its, uh, you know, in its form. Now, remember the Spanish missions, okay? This was how the Spanish would, you know, they would build basically a church and a community center here. And so with that, you know, just understanding that spreading the Catholic religion, Okay, so the Spanish did not bring a lot of colonists, um, but they also had an organized program of evangelism. Okay, so that's something that we want to note, uh, we want to note here. And then I've got a little video made, I made several years ago when I did this series um, that I talked about General Patton. You know, General Patton said, leave me, follow me, or get out of my way. And so for the Spanish, when they tell, you know, the natives, it's like, follow us, you know, be like us, learn Spanish, pay taxes, adopt the Catholic religion, uh, you know, very, very, uh, you know, very like adamant about adopting the Catholic religion, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, leading to uh, some uh, persecution and revolt based on that. But you want to note here, while all of the you know, while all of the European colonizers are doing at least some of Christian evangelism, we want to note that the Spanish and the French, they have organized programs that are sponsored by their governments, okay? And speaking of the French, and again, this is available on my YouTube channel, okay? So I'm giving y'all abbreviated versions of, uh, you know, some things here. Now, Note the French, you know, they had the biggest territorial claim, but they had the least to back it up. You know, they claimed all this, you know, basically when LaSalle got to the Mississippi River, something allowed him, as he saw it, to claim all of the land that borders the Mississippi River and any of its tributaries. So he claimed all of this for France, but then France, you know, had very few colonists and you really did not see a lot of French outside of their forts. Now, France, it's it's not necessarily that the French are just biologically or culturally better people than the Spanish, um, but where the French found themselves, they were engaging in the fur trade. 
And this is something, again, this is an exchange, okay? And what we see here is that fridge fur traders, they have to cultivate a very friendly relationship with the natives that they encounter because they are relying on these natives to bring them furs and to trade them for French goods. And so with this, you know, it wasn't unusual for a French fur trader to, uh, you know, to marry uh, a native, uh, to take a native wife and marry her because that's where you've got these kinship networks. What we want to understand when we talk about the Colombian exchange and capitalism, okay? Capitalism is the sort of thing that you don't necessarily have to be friends or family with whoever you're doing business with, but in most of these native cultures, doing business was also being part of the family. It was a kinship network. Everything revolves around uh, around the family. And so, when the French fur traders, they would, uh, you know, they would marry, uh, you know, native women, and that would build those kinship networks. Now, of course, that was one thing too um, that the French Jesuit priests. Now, while the Spanish would build missions, um, the French and teach uh, the Spanish language. Language, the French Jesuit priests, they would go with, okay, we see here Father Marquette, you know, there's a, uni a Jesuit university um, called Marquette. And so with this, uh, you know, you see that French Jesuit priests, instead of building a mission, they would go out and they would live among the natives, okay? So basically, you know, the na these native tribes would be allied with the French, they would trade, and remember trading is also ideas. The French would say, look, here is one of our priests, and we would like for him to come live in your village. And of course, the French Catholic priest would, uh, you know, would preach, but the conversions would were entirely voluntary, okay? And so that's one of the things that you're seeing here, all because of the situation, okay? So the French, you know, they're thinking more along the lines of, lead us, you know, show us how to do your ceremonies. Like the French um, famously had the friendliest relationship. So you can think the friendly French, right? And so here, like the Spanish, they're Catholic, they're sending priests, but also fur traders, okay? The primary economic activity is the fur trade. The settlements are trading posts. Few, uh, you know, few colonists. Yes, on evangelism and lead me. Now, when we're thinking about comparison, all right. So this is the sort of thing. Some of y'all are going to be taking uh, the paper pencil exam, which has an LEQ. Now, also, all of you are going to have SAQs. And so when you think about the SAQs, the SAQs could also ask you to compare. Now, note here one thing I want to tell you about the SAQs um, is that they can they can not only ask you to compare the Spanish with the French, but a few years ago, there was an SAQ asking you to compare the Spanish with the New England colonists, okay? So it's like, you know, how can we compare the Spanish and New England? So on one hand, you've got Spanish, French, Dutch, English. And then on the other axis, you've got in the 13 colonies, New England, Middle and Southern. So any of those can be, you know, somebody could say what would be um, something between the Spanish and the um, Southern, you know, in the, in the English Southern colonies. OK, so that could come up. So what we see here is that the French and the Spanish, they have religion in common, right? So if we're thinking about comparison, they're both Catholic. Now, they are engaged in a different kind of economy, okay? So rather than missions, you see trading posts of the French. Now, they both sent very few colonists. And yes, remember on an organized program of evangelism. So when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about, okay, what do the Spanish have that is unique? Now, don't write, lead me or follow me on your LEQ or your SAQ. This is just a memory device here, okay? This is just a memory device um, when we're thinking about how to, you know, think about how are the French and the Spanish relating, okay? So how are they relating to uh, the natives that they encounter and what is similar, what is different? Now, another thing we want to note, again, it's not that the French are just naturally better people, People, even though every French person that I've met, you know, has typically been a great, uh, great human being, um, but they're all trying to make money, okay? So for the Spanish, you know, conquest, plunder, forced labor, that helped them make money. Whereas for the French, 
by, you know, getting furs from the natives. And the way to get those furs is to have a friendly and very equal exchange-based relationship. So we want to be able to get those nuances. Now, the Dutch, like the French, and I've got a, I've got a lecture on New Netherland um, on, my, on my channel. If you just type in Tom Ritchie Colonial America playlist, um, you will get uh, you will get these full lectures. OK. Um, and so with that, you know, the Dutch are like the French in the sense that they're participating in the fur trade. Um, but then, you know, when we're looking here, we are also, uh, you know, we're seeing let's see, where is my New Netherland? Uh, I've got it, uh, got it somewhere. Okay, somewhere in there. But basically, that's one thing. Now, I love the, uh, I love the Dutch. You know, I've been to France and I've been to the Netherlands. Uh, you know, very, uh, you know, blessed to have been both places. Um, but it's really great. Like, you know, when you see the French, or like just so, like, you know, it's a very generous spirit. Like, if you stay in an Airbnb, like in. France, uh, you know, typically they'll throw in some little extras, you know, when you go into a French Airbnb, you know, they'll have some, you know, hey, we've got some breakfast items here for you and that sort of thing. You know, you go to the Netherlands and you stay in like a Dutch Airbnb, it's like, they're not putting in extras for you. They don't, they don't feel like they're required to. Their culture is very direct. And you said that you were going to pay for something. And so therefore, this is what you paid for. And there you go. Like, like the Dutch, it's a wonderful culture because you always know how the Dutch people feel about you. You know, so for example, there was one time that I was, uh, you know, at a friend's house and I had to catch the train. And, uh, you know, my friend's, uh, my friend's mother actually asked, do you uh, do you need to go catch your train? Is it about time? And for a second, I was like, is she trying to get rid of me? Is she telling me it's time to go? And I said, no, she's Dutch. You know, she's actually, if it were time for me to go, she'd just tell me it was time to go. Um, so the Dutch, really, it's like the French are concerned about saving souls in addition to the fur trade. Um, but one thing about the Dutch, the Dutch in New Netherland, present day New York, um, they they are involved in the fur trade, but they're much more strictly business. OK, so when we're thinking about the Protestants, uh, you know, the Dutch and the, um, you know, in the English, what we're getting out of that is that both the Dutch and the English are Protestant and they're not really as concerned with, uh, you know, with the, you know, we could think of as the soul trade, uh, for example, uh, you know, but the French and the Spanish very much so they're directed by their governments to convert, uh, you know, natives to Christianity. So with that, you know, as we're uh, as we're looking into this, so the Dutch again are involved in the fur trade, and that could certainly, uh, you know, could certainly come up. So with that, we'll note that the Dutch they are different from the French in that they're Protestant, uh, whereas the French are Catholic. Um, they are the Dutch are bringing a few more colonists. You see more than the French and the Spanish, but not necessarily as many as the English. And then again, no evangelism. So it's the same economy as the French, but then again, you don't have the same organized program of evangelism. And so from there, when we're thinking about the English, okay, the last thing here when we're thinking about the English is that they're in the Atlantic coast in Canada. They're Protestant. Um, now, the English, you know, they're a bit different from the others because um, the English are, you know, they're coming in here and they are actually, their primary purpose is to settle, okay? So we see settlers and particularly religious dissidents, okay? Like people like the Puritans and the Separatists and the Quakers, people who did not fit in um, in the early 17th century when the Church of England was the mandated religion. And so we see a lot of religious dissidents coming from different for different reasons. And so from there, agriculture is really the one of the biggest things here that they are wanting, that they are wanting, uh, you know, agriculture. And so with this, we see that they are sending many colonists. And since they're sending many now, again, evangelism, when I say no, I'm not saying that there were not. OK, I'm not saying that there were there were not evangelists, but there is not an organized program. Um, so as far as this uh, as this goes, uh, that, you know, for example, Roger Williams, this is an interesting thing, because if we think about Roger Williams, who was exiled um, from the Massachusetts colony for saying, like, wait for it, he said that people shouldn't be forced to profess a religion. And they're like, 
out. Okay, out. Uh, you know, and so he has to he has to go. It's like, hey, I think you should take your ball and go home. Just get out of here. And Roger Williams goes. Now, Roger Williams preached to the natives, but he never actually baptized a single Native American because he didn't think that their professions were sincere. Like he want, he was only going to baptize um, a Native if he felt like they were making a sincere profession of faith. Um, and of course, remember Roger Williams was a Baptist. They believe in believers baptism. Now the French and the Spanish, they'll baptize anybody willing any day of the week, okay? So that's something to note here and that the English, you know, where Patton says, leave me, follow me, or get out of my way, the English are like, get out of the way, okay? Like you are getting in our way and we are trying to farm crops. And so that is of course why, you know, when you think about the French and Indian War, why the natives are gonna overwhelmingly prefer the French. Now the English had a few allies such as the Iroquois, but the Iroquois didn't really do anything like you know they they didn't like the british were very um upset at their allies because the allies of the british really didn't do a whole lot to help them whereas the allies of the french they saw this as a life and death struggle that we cannot allow the english to uh you know to um, to uh, defeat the French. Uh, so that's something that is very important to note there. And again, here, as we're looking, uh, as we're looking there, I've got, uh, I've got this. Now, let me go ahead and grab that organizer. And I'm going to add that to the Google document. Okay, let me see if I can, if I'm able to find that real quick. Uh, actually, it doesn't look like um, that's uh, immediately apparent there. But, uh, but then let me, I can get in there and um, save this real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and save as, and that's, uh, let's see. All right. So that way we'll just get that in the Google Doc so you can look at it. But again, remember you are welcome to, uh, you know, take a look at these things on my YouTube channel, but I do want to make sure that, uh, that you're getting that. Okay. So with that, let's see, just a quick save. All right. So uh, Tom, there's a couple other uh, questions right now too. If oh you know, yeah. Let's go ahead and do that while I'm, well, while I'm doing this. Most of the ones are just as far as anxiety regarding uh, what about in this section, how many short answer questions, what about the, uh, the uh, DBQs, the LAQs, what about, uh, and also what would you think would be the most important uh, thing to remember, take away uh, tonight so far? Okay, so as far as like, you know, test construction, now one thing I will, I will let everybody know when people ask, like in particular, like what is, what are the most asked things on the exam? Uh, what I always say to this is that, uh, you know, if you were taking the exam like 10 times, then I would be more likely to want to get into what I call Vegas odds. You know, when we're thinking about Vegas odds in terms of this is what's likely to be here. But then since you're only taking the exam one time, just remember that there's really anything in the course and exam description could come up. Now, one thing that we can say to provide a little bit of comfort is pre-1607 only makes up about 5% of the exam, okay? So when it comes down to it, now the DBQ is not gonna come from any time before 1754. So when we're looking at this, the DBQ will not come from colonial America. The American Revolution um, and the aftermath of the French and Indian War, that is the earliest point for a DBQ, okay? So we won't see a DBQ come from before that. SAQs, we could see, okay, we could see SAQs on this time period. Um, and so with that, the main, the main things that I see, and Sean, feel free to, uh, you know, to give your input on this um, from your experience, but the main things I typically see are comparisons, you know, that the most important things here are to be able to compare, uh, you know, the, you know, the different uh, colonizers to compare the New England middle and southern colonies. And from there, also to know a few things like the Columbian Exchange and the key um, things about uh, about native tribes. But this is definitely something we're not getting into DBQ country yet. Now, also, we might want to think about, uh, you know, if this is your first time at a Bill of Rights Institute webinar, um, the Bill of Rights Institute did several, uh, you know, did several broadcasts, um, you know, in, in the weeks before this that we're focusing on skill-based stuff, okay? So like basically we're doing mostly content 
in this series, but definitely subscribe to the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube channel and go check out the previous A Push series um, that was there um, because that's going to be focusing on a lot of skill based stuff. And so my directive here is to focus mostly on the on the content. Um, so as far as that uh, as that goes, um, LEQs. Now LEQs. Basically, what we're seeing is they're going to be if you're taking the paper pencil exam, then the LEQ is going to. It's basically there's going to be an LEQ from the first third of the course, the second third of the course, and the last third of the course. Okay, so basically one of the LEQs will be pre 1800. The second LEQ will be like anywhere between 1800 and 1898. And then the third LEQ will be somewhere between 1890 and the present uh, day or like 1980 or something like that. Now, I have informally said that I, I highly doubt that we're going to see like post-World War II, um, all, you know, figure very highly into at least the paper pencil administration. Um, given that those of you who are doing paper pencil, um, given that this is something that, you know, y'all are going to be taking it earlier and a lot of school districts have really been behind, um, that I don't see this being something that we're going to see like a, like a big like essay topic or something like that on something after World War II. Now that's just a guess. The College Board has said that they are giving full exams, okay? So that's something that we want to note on that, that the College Board has said these are gonna be full exams, but I think when we're looking at, uh, you know, the backlash that would come out um, in the case that, you know, if, if we were to see like a post-World War II uh, DDQ, I think that the backlash would be so much that the Test Development Committee is probably aware of this. But again, that is just a, uh, you know, that is just something here that I'm putting out there, okay? So going for that, so yes, yeah, 1607 is basically the founding of the, uh, you know, of the first uh, English permanent settlement, okay, where we see the beginnings of the 13 colonies. Now with that, I'm gonna let y'all know that I've also got complete lectures um, on um, the 13 colonies. Now, what I've done here, you don't need to know every single colony. Uh, what I would note is I would focus here on colonial Virginia, for example, as a representative of the Southern colonies, okay? So if you wanna see the full lecture, be sure to take a look at that. Um, but as far as that goes, like the English tended to be pretty, uh, you know, pretty diverse with their types of colonies. Like you've got basically some colonies that were run by the, by the directly by the crown, by the government. Um, some colonies that were run by joint stock colonies as businesses, okay? So a joint stock, or corporate colony is going to be a colony that is run as a business, okay? And so then finally, there's the proprietary colony that basically someone owns it. Uh, an example here would be William Penn in Pennsylvania, who, uh, you know, was basically the crown owed his father money. And he was like, you know what, would you give me a colony in uh, instead of paying me? And Charles II, who always had trouble with finances, he's like, sure thing, I would be glad add to. And so with that, Jamestown is founded in 1607. This is a year that you should be familiar with, because before 1607, there is not, uh, you know, not an English colonial presence in, uh, you know, in North America. Now, the Virginia colony's not doing so well at first, but then John Rolfe comes around, which uh, some of y'all might have, uh, you know, right, remember John Rolfe and John Smith from the Pocahontas cartoon when y'all were growing up, but John Rolfe was a real Virginian, and in addition to marrying Pocahontas, um, John Rolfe uh, found a way to make the colony profitable. Uh, they first thought that they were going to emulate the Spanish. You know, the Spanish had brought back a lot of gold. And so the English at first, they're like, we can bring back a lot of gold too. They thought that the new world just had plenty of everything. And it turns out that there really wasn't a lot of gold uh, in Virginia, which means like basically none. But John Rolfe is able to grow a new strain of tobacco. Like the English had uh, really not been too impressed with tobacco at first, but, you know, John Rolfe grows this new strain and it becomes very, very popular in England. So what we want to note here is the Southern colonies are, the economy of the Southern colonies is based on growing 
cash crops, okay? And what I mean by a cash crop is that is a crop meant to sell, okay? That is a crop sold for money, not a crop that is grown for food, okay? It's going to be the middle colonies where we're going to see what we call staple crops like wheat and corn, where the specialization like Pennsylvania, New York, uh, New Jersey, uh, these are seen as the breadbasket colonies. But in the southern colonies, um, what we're going to see here is a cash crop, okay? And then so this cash crop is very labor intensive. At first, uh, being farmed by indentured servants. These were poor Europeans who then uh, basically agreed to a fixed term of labor in order to pay for their passage. Uh, the indenture, okay, this comes from the indenture, which sounds like teeth, and there's a reason for that, because the contract would be basically torn in a way that it resembles teeth, and the way that you have the the copy here that like somebody else would have an identical copy and they could be put together. And then maybe there'd be even be a third copy that's at the courthouse, but the way you know it's legitimate is if they could be put together. And so with this, uh, you know, you start to see that, um, you know, that African slaves become the main labor force in Virginia as slavery becomes institutionalized. Now, you'll note here that, uh, you know, slavery did not immediately become the primary labor force. It was really after 1675 that it starts to shoot up. Now, one of the things, one of the reasonings behind that is Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, uh, that basically, uh, you know, the uh, you know, the indentured servitude model becomes unfavorable because these indentured servants, then they move out onto the frontier. Um, they complain about, uh, you know, about what's going on there. And then they come and they burn the town. OK, so that's something that we're going to see that Bacon's rebellion can be seen as a causal factor here in the rise of slavery as a uh, you know, as a labor system in the Virginia colony. Now, another thing I want to mention here is I don't know if I've got a, you know, I think I've got a slide for that. Some, yes, that Virginia and Maryland are Chesapeake colonies. Okay. So sometimes uh, when we're looking at this, like, uh, you know, so for going from, uh, going from here, where did I, um, yeah. So we've got here in the course and exam description. So the Chesapeake and North Carolina colonies, okay, grew prosperous on um, growing tobacco, okay? So we can see here, they expect you to know about the Chesapeake Bay. And a lot of times, now those of you from Virginia and Maryland may, you know, laugh at us, but, uh, you know, I find that a lot of students, they confuse the Chesapeake Bay with the Massachusetts Bay. OK, but the Chesapeake Bay is there in Virginia and Maryland. So you want to make sure that when we're talking about the Chesapeake, we're talking about Virginia and Maryland, kind of the upper um, the upper southern colonies. OK, now Maryland is kind of an anomaly because economically it's a southern colony. OK, so it's a tobacco growing colony economically. But then when you look at its religious culture, it operates more like a middle colony because Lord Baltimore uh, founded that colony as a haven for Catholics. OK, so that's something that is very important, uh, that is very important there. So going from there, you know, that's the Chesapeake. So we want to understand the Chesapeake colonies. We're talking about Virginia and Maryland, really the upper south. And so uh, we've seen questions where um, you're called upon to have the, you know, to, co to compare the Chesapeake colonies with the New England colonies. And so with that, we also want to note here, and again, a lot of these, I've got more thorough, uh, you know, more thorough accounts here, uh, you know, on my YouTube channel, okay? But at the same time, you know, you do want to understand that uh, in late colonial America, okay? So we're thinking about like in the 1700s, the 18th century, we've got a few movements that we want to look at um, in terms of religious and intellectual movements. Now, one of those is is the first great awakening okay so the first great awakening um which is a movement uh that's basically a religious revival that they're bringing in uh you know this very emotional religion it's something that is you know playing a lot better with people who are you know from the from the lower classes rather than people who are from the upper established classes um you know a more emotional preaching hellfire and brimstone one thing we want to know 
note about this. So when we talk about exchanges, okay? So when we talk about exchanges, um, what we're thinking about here is here is, uh, you know, George Whitefield, Whitfield, it's a written test, you know, as far as that goes, the, the English would say Whitfield, um, but it's spelled Whitefield. Now, George Whitfield was an English minister who made several trips back and forth. Now, when we talk about Atlantic trade, the Columbian exchange and all of that, you know, we want to note that the first great awakening was something that that represented an exchange of ideas across Across the English speaking world. Okay, so basically, the, the first great awakening is going on in England, it's going on in New England, it's going on in the middle and southern colonies, it is not restricted to any colonial section, or even to the colonies themselves. Okay, so that's something that's going to be important there. Now, the first great awakening is based on emotion. Now, similarly to how people think differently in our culture today, um, you know, people, the first great awakening was something that was all over the colonies, but at the same time, it wasn't like everybody is into it, okay? Because at the same time, we want to remember the European Enlightenment that is also coming to the colonies, okay? So the American Enlightenment, um, which is an 18th century intellectual movement that is based on emphasis on rational thinking and really not as big on emotions. Now, again, there's a lecture on this as well, the American Enlightenment. And so what we see here, we see some very strong influence um, from John Locke, okay? And of course, John Locke being somebody who was uh, a political theorist whose theories were very influential on the Declaration of Independence. So Locke, um, you know, natural rights of life, liberty, and property. Jefferson is invoking Locke very directly in the Declaration of Independence. So with that, you know, a lot of the values that we see coming into the United States, you know, natural rights, religious toleration, um, empiricism, gaining knowledge from experience rather than tradition. Now, the three pillars of the American Enlightenment, as I would identify them, are Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Paine, okay? So these are three, like when you look at basically Jefferson, um, the Declaration of Independence was very much uh, you know, was very much influenced by the Enlightenment, you know, when Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal, that, you know, everyone is equal in rights, okay, that there, you know, it doesn't matter if you are a colonist or you are from Britain, that, uh, that basically these natural rights apply to everyone, okay, that, you know, regardless of whether you were born in the colonies or whether or not you have a title of nobility. Now, these are the things that Jefferson is answering in particular, that where you were born or have, you know, whether or not you have a title of nobility, uh, these things should not matter. Of course, in the years since, our view of the Declaration of Independence, uh, you know, promise that all men are created equal, we see this in a much more, you know, broad perspective. Benjamin Franklin also being someone who was a, you know, was a big time inventor, the lightning rod, bifocal, stuff like that. Thomas Paine, remember common sense. Now, when we think about this, Thomas Paine was one of the earliest professional revolutionaries I can think of. And when you look at this common sense, the rights of man, the age of reason, all of his books have very enlightenment kind of cues. Now, the funny thing about common sense is that even though Thomas Paine is a deist, he does not believe, uh, you know, in Christianity, he does not believe in the Bible or the divinity of Jesus Christ. But even though he is a deist, which is basically, you know, literally godism, um, he uses the Bible in common sense, because he is, now this is where we would think of an audience consideration, okay? Why would Thomas Paine, a deist, refer to the Bible when making a case for American independence? Well, the reason he's doing this is because he, um, you know, he is reaching out to an audience, okay? He wouldn't be going very far if he said, uh, you know, some of the things that he would write later that, uh, you know, the Bible is just uh, a bunch of stories, um, you know, that uh, that don't make any sense. 
that wouldn't have played very well with his audience. So remember when you're doing a DVQ, you want to make sure that you, I mean, I, I would say that audience analysis is the most difficult of all of the DVQ categories of analysis. I would say that purpose is always the easiest. Then if you know history, historical context, you know, bringing in an example of something that's not socially distanced from the document, you know, outside evidence should be something that's not mentioned in the documents at all. Uh, then when we think about historical context, it's like, let's say the document mentions the Stamp Act. Well, you would bring in, well, I know some more information about the Stamp Act. I can give some more context. So it's not socially distanced from the document, but it is relevant and you can use it to explain more. So with that, we definitely want to note here what's, uh, you know, what's going on and how the religion of deism, you know, this way of looking at God was held by a lot of the founding fathers. Now, many of whom were also Christians as well. You know, basically we got some of our founding fathers were Christians. Um, some were, uh, you know, some were deist, uh, you know, a few were uh, of other religious persuasions. And so with that, let's see, Sean, do we have any, uh, you know, any last minute questions coming up? I see the chat looks pretty active. Yeah, I think I think we've all taken care of it. Uh, one one student had a great uh, question, and as soon as she said it, you launched into it, so that worked out very well. Okay, well, <laughs> and I think we're good. All right, so so one thing that we want to uh, that we want to drive home is that we are going to be here. Remember, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Make sure to subscribe to the Bill of Rights YouTube channel. Uh, make sure, uh, you know, Sean, uh, what uh, I, I think also the Bill of Rights Institute is on, uh, you know, is on social media, like with, uh, you know, with Instagram um, and all that. So if there are any, I think there is, if I'm not mistaken, BRI students um, on Instagram. Of course, mine's, uh, you know, at Tom Ritchie, but BRI students is going to have some good stuff uh, as well. So Sean, if we can welcome you back on camera and we'll let you, uh, uh, take it from here. Thank you. Well, all. Yeah, thank you. That was fantastic stuff too, by the way, and great questions and great chatting by the students. It's, it's, uh, it's so great. So uh, yeah, what we have here, there's so much to look forward to at the uh, Bill of Rights Institute. I mean, once you get on Instagram, once you get on social media and all that stuff, plus if you check the website, uh, the student hub, I mean, there's the uh, student essay contest, the Constitutional Academy resource library, think the vote, homework help videos, a lot of the homework help things uh, I was uh, putting in the chat or we put on the uh, document that Tom so graciously uh, linked with this so you can get to that. But we have a lot going on here. We have uh, this is just one night down and we're going to have eight other nights. Uh, available to you. Uh, as mentioned before, there was strategy sessions, and this is a massive content boost for you. So you can kind of hear it, maybe the same stuff you hear by your credible and competent teachers, but a little bit something else for you to hear that will really help you uh, kind of bring something home, any little thing you can to get there. Tomorrow evening, we'll be doing the American Revolution, uh, discussing the causes of the American Revolution, the key events and the effects of the revolution on politics and society and everything revolved around that. So it's going to be great. There's a lot of great stuff for you. And, and the Bill of Rights Institute is mission is to get this information to you and help you. I think, Tom, if you have anything else to say, we can uh, bring you back in. But other than that, I think, okay. I think we're well, good yeah, to go. just uh, always a pleasure. And y'all be sure to tell your friends if you found this helpful. And we'll see y'all tomorrow evening to uh, get into the American Revolution. Picking up steam like a snowball rolling downhill. We'll get you in that, that test. All right, guys. It's a pleasure. Have a great evening.